Hello, my friend. Welcome to your sleep story. My name is Stephen Dalton. I'm an Irish storyteller, and it's my great privilege to be the voice that you listen to as you go to sleep tonight. Tonight, we have another compilation of some of our most popular stories. These are our train stories. You will travel on the Orient Express, on a train through India, on a train through Ireland, on a train through Chile, and indeed on a magic train. There are two new stories that have not been released yet that are part of this compilation. One that is very close to my heart, the train journey in Ireland. As always, I hope you like this collection, and I wish you a deep and pleasant sleep. I grew up loving trains. I've always loved getting on the train and going somewhere. Doesn't really matter always where it might be. It's just the experience of being on a train that I love, sitting down, letting all my worries melt away, and just being in that moment. I don't know what it is, but it's a very special thing. I'd love to hear from you if you've had a special train experience in your life, and I really hope you like tonight's story. It's a story where I talk about my own life with trains, and then I fall into a deep sleep and find myself traveling on a train in 1930s Ireland. Okay, let's do the relaxation session before tonight's story. It will take a few minutes. I'm going to count down from 10 to 1. And as I do, allow yourself to let go more and more. 10. Feel the support beneath you, the bed or the floor, and the earth, the constantness of the earth that is always supporting you. With that in mind, allow that feeling of support to enable you to let go more, release more. Nine, feel into your body. Where are you holding? Maybe in your hands, In your feet, in your belly, in your face, your body has worked hard for you today. Allow it to let go. Eight. Feel the coziness of this moment. The ability to just lie down. To listen to the sound of my voice about Christmas time. Enjoy this moment. Seven. Perhaps allow a little gratitude for the simple things like your breath, the shelter you have tonight,
people you love. Six. The day is done. Whatever has been, has been. Whatever will be, will be. Whatever thoughts you have about today, they're not useful right now. Don't fight them. Just see them for what they are, thoughts, and let them float away like leaves on a little river. And the same goes for thoughts about the future. All that you have is now. Five, this is your time. This is your moment. You deserve rest. You deserve sleep. We all do. So be kind to yourself. Continue to let go now. It's okay to let go and move towards sleep. Four. You are safe. Allow my voice to be an anchor of safety tonight that only takes you to safe places. Three. Begin to engage with your imagination now. Begin to feel the coziness of a train carriage on a rainy day. Enjoy this moment. Two. Let go. More and more. Know that peace lives within you. It's always there. It's just waiting to be seen. One, completely relax now, as I tell you tonight's sleep story. I'm on a train in Ireland, my homeland. I love a train anywhere in the world. But when I'm on a train in Ireland, there's something extra special about it. I'm at home, and I'm doing one of my favorite things. Sitting on a train, watching the world go by. It's raining outside the window. I can't see much, just the misty green hills, these ancient hills and fields that were once covered in trees. You know, they say that Ireland used to be completely covered in forest, and if you were a little red squirrel, you could go from tree to tree, all the way down through the island, 
without touching the ground once. I love this land. I love this place. Even though for most of my life I have traveled, leaving these shores for one reason or another. There's something about Ireland, about the fact that I was born here, and that my people come from here, that makes it feel extra special. It's home. As I sit on this train, traveling down the east coast of Ireland, incidentally one of the most beautiful train rides I've ever been on, I look out the window. I always know which seat to sit on. Or should I say, which side to sit on? If you're going south, say from Dublin to Wexford, you should always sit on the left of the train. That is, if you want to have a beautiful view of the Irish Sea. It's funny, really. Now Ireland is considered one of the most beautiful countries in the world. And yet we only see pictures of the West. The East Coast certainly has its charm as well. But I do love the West. If you're not from Ireland. Maybe you've seen pictures or videos of it. The west coast is the side of the island that has the Atlantic Ocean, so that's the more weather-beaten side. The east coast has the calmer Irish Sea, who has less weather-beating. But I have a deep relationship with the trains of this country. For a large part of my childhood, I lived in a town called Dundalk, up on the northeast coast of the country. And when I was a kid, or should I say, when I was a teenager, getting out of Dundalk was all I wanted to do. You see, I was born in Dublin and I felt more at home there. And so once I was of a certain age, thirteen, fourteen maybe, my parents would let me get on the train and go to Dublin for acting classes and other things like that. So for me, the train represented freedom. It represented a journey into my exciting young life. I still remember going into the train station in Dundalk, buying my ticket, getting on the fancy train sometimes, and sometimes the old train. You see, because Dundalk was right in the middle between Dublin and Belfast, the European Union gave lots of money to the Irish state to buy fancy trains for cross-border relations. So, the Dundalk to Dublin line was served by a train called the Enterprise. This was a train made in France, I believe, 
and it was so modern in the late 1990s. I still remember the voice of the man that came on the intercom. Even in those days, they had these artificial voices. I didn't like them then, and I don't like them now. But I can still remember what it said. Welcome on board the 1520 Enterprise Service to Belfast. Calling at Drogheda, Dundalk, Newry, Portadown, and Belfast Central. Of course, my favorite one was, we are now arriving in Dublin Connolly. Please ensure you have all your personal belongings with you. Thank you for traveling on this enterprise service, and we hope we will see you again soon. It's funny how these things come back to you. I always had little rituals on the train. Little things that I would do. In my teenage years, I would have my disc man and I would listen to my favorite CDs. In those years, I would listen to Radiohead, OK Computer, on repeat, or The Smashing Pumpkins, or Oasis. I remember those people those musicians offering an escape, an alternative way of life to my young artistic brain, I suppose. And then, of course, sometimes the enterprise wouldn't come and it would be the old train. Now the old train was funny because back in those days, there was a smoking carriage. Now I am not the youngest person in the world, but I'm not the oldest either. And the fact that in my lifetime you could sit on a train and smoke cigarettes seems crazy to my mind now. Anyway, I digress. As I was saying, I always have little rituals on the train. Listening to music eating a sandwich, reading a book, writing in my journal, or just looking out the window, dwelling on whatever comes to mind. There is a peace that comes with being on the train. There is a liberation. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure you can understand what I'm saying. Anyway, I'm feeling very sleepy now. And as I sit, and watch the east coast of Ireland 
from the train. Rocky cliffs. And the blue sea under the misty rain. My eyes grow heavy. And I start to dream. In this dream, I'm still on a train. And it's still raining. And I'm still in Ireland. But the train is different. It reminds me more of that old train I mentioned earlier. It feels almost like I'm in a different time. I look around and I see that I am in a private cabin. It's all wood panel and it's very ornate and beautiful. The train sounds different too. And in the distance I think I can hear the sound of a steam engine. I decide to take a little walk around. I open my door and walk along the carpeted corridor. I first encounter a very finely dressed conductor. looking extremely well put together. He has a fine moustache and nods to me politely. I look down at my clothes. I'm wearing clothes from a different time. I look like my great-grandfather in the photos my mother showed me of when he was young. His name was Stephen too. Stephen Dalton, in fact. I continue walking. I see that my fellow passengers are equally dressed in very fine clothes. These garments are no fast fashion. Each garment that is upon the passengers has been expertly crafted handmade. There is a different feeling in the air. I can't quite describe it. But soon it becomes apparent. I am indeed in a different time. And by the looks of it, It is 1930s Ireland. I've always dreamed of time travel. 
I always wished to visit Dublin in the 1800s and walk the same streets of Oscar Wilde and W.B. Yeats. But the 1930s isn't so bad either. I am fascinated to learn a little about this world just to soak up its atmosphere. I go back to my cabin. I close the door behind me. And I see that I have a bag with me. I open it up. And sure enough, just as I had been talking about them, there are two books, one by Oscar Wilde and another by W. B. Yeats. I open Yeats first. It's still raining outside, and I look into the mist and see distance, bottoms of mountains, and little fairy hills closer and just about visible. And I feel cozy here, safe, in fact, on this old train, in this old world, and I begin to read some W.B. Yeats. The first poem I stumble upon is The Lake Isle of Inish Free. I will arise and go now, and go to Inish Free, and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight saw a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway, or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. I think of Yeats in this moment, a person who contributed greatly to the establishment of Ireland as a country in a cultural sense. He loved a particular place in Ireland very deeply, a beautiful county called Sligo on the west coast of Ireland, just below Donegal. There is a mountain there called Ben Bulban, a place that I hadn't been to until quite recently in my life, when I saw a photograph of it, I told my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, we are going there now, 
wherever it is. And we got in the car and drove for three hours and stayed the night not far from Ben Bulban. And there I discovered Yates' country. Now I pick up the Oscar Wilde book. I see that it is called The Picture of Dorian Gray, a book that I like very much. Oscar Wilde was born in Dublin in 1854. He lived in a beautiful square in Dublin called Marion Square. The houses of Marion Square were built by the rich in the 1700s. And you can still see them today. They look on the outside pretty much as they did 300 years ago. By the time Oscar Wilde moved in, in the middle of the 1800s, these houses were already old. When I think of Oscar Wilde's Dublin, I always try to imagine what the air would feel like, what the sounds would be, what the smells would be. And I have always loved his writing. He studied at Trinity College as did my father, a university established by Elizabeth I in the 1500s. I look out the window of the train. The mist has cleared slightly, and I can see beautiful high cliffs rising from the Atlantic. I can see the ocean, that timeless force that has been a constant companion to my island long before I ever existed, or Oscar Wilde for that matter. I start with chapter one. I don't intend on reading it all, but it is such beautiful literature, and it feels like a nice moment to read from this book. The studio was filled with the rich odor of roses, and when the light summer wind stirred amidst the trees of the garden, there came through the open door the heavy scent of the lilac, or the more delicate perfume of the pink flowering thorn. From the corner of the divan of Persian saddlebags, on which he was lying, smoking, as usual, innumerable cigarettes. Lord Henry Wotton could just catch the gleam of the honey-sweet and honey-colored blossoms of the laburnum, whose tremulous branches seemed hardly able to bear the burden of a beauty so flame-like as theirs. And now and then, the fantastic shadows of birds in flight flitted across the long, tussore silk curtains that were stretched in front of the huge window, producing a kind of momentary Japanese effect, 
and making him think of those pallid, jade-faced painters who, in an art that is necessarily immobile, seem to convey the sense of swiftness and motion. The sullen murmur of the bees shouldering their way through the long, unmown grass or circling with monotonous insistence round the black, crocketed spires of the early June hollyhocks seemed to make the stillness more oppressive, and the dim roar of London was like the burden note of a distant organ. In the center of the room, clamped to an upright easel, stood the full-length portrait of a young man of extraordinary personal beauty, and in front of it, some little distance away, was sitting the artist himself, Basil Hallward, whose sudden disappearance some years ago caused, at the time, such public excitement and gave rise to so many strange conjectures. I put the book down. I sit back in my cozy cabin on this old train in this old Ireland and I close my eyes for a moment. How different is this world, I think, to the one I live in normally. How different are the people. How different are their needs. As far as I can tell, They all love, they all feel joy, sadness, envy, loss, all of the things we feel today, the only thing that differentiates us is years. Years and uh, advancement, I suppose. We have different things today to preoccupy us. I wonder, are they happier in this time? In the 1930s, I mean. They don't have Lots of the things we have. But then, we don't have lots of the things they have. Who knows, I think. One thing they definitely have in this time is a much more extensive rail network. And I am thoroughly enjoying traveling along train line that has long been abandoned in my time. As the rain starts to slightly clear, I continue to look out the window. And I see mountains now. Mountains that look familiar to me. Of course, the mountains haven't changed since the 1930s. I am in Connemara, the wondrous national park in County Galway. One of my, if not my, 
favorite place on planet Earth. I remember my first experience of this place. I was twelve, and my father brought us for a holiday to the west coast. I genuinely had no idea that such a landscape existed on my island. I remember sitting in the back seat of the car. The year was 1995, and we had a video camera. I remember filming through the window the amazing mountains rising out of the land. Here is where the famous Connemara marble comes from, the greeny colored marble. It is also where the Connemara pony is from. Ponies in Connemara roam free as free as the wind, and they roam through the beautiful land in herds. There is a rumor, I can't say if it's true or not, that the Connemara pony has very strong blood. It is said to be a mix of the horses from the Vikings, who were once invaders of Ireland, and also horses from the Spanish Armada, the huge group of boats that sank as they came up towards England in the 1500s. They say a lot of the horses got onto land ran into the west of Ireland, mated with the Viking horses, and created the Connemara Pony. They also say that's why Connemara people look a little bit Mediterranean. I'll say no more about that. But anyway, I remember that time. I remember we stumbled upon a horse fair in a place I believe was called Letter Frack. That's when I really fell in love with my country. I'd spent years traveling around Europe with my dad's work, and at the age of ten had returned. But when I went to Connemara, at the age of twelve, that's when I started to understand the real beauty of Ireland. One of the things I love about Ireland is the people. In fact, the people and the landscape, they're the two best things. And when you meet an Irish person who really wants to welcome you, it is a deeply special experience. And I remember the friendliness of those people at the horse fair. And I remember how they spoke to each other. Anyway, I realize as I sit on this train, that I am in Connemara, 
and I must be going towards Clifton. This is a train line that closed in 1935, the Galway to Clifton line. And as I look out at the land of my beloved Connemara, that looks in a way like a beautiful lunar landscape with grass. I feel very blessed to be in this moment. Dream or no dream, it feels real to me. I look at the rocks formed millions of years ago. I look at the raindrops on the window. So familiar to me being Irish. And in a way it's extremely comforting. There's a cozy feeling when there's a blanket of cloud above. I feel at home here. I feel so at home. that I begin to feel very sleepy as I sit in my cozy cabin in the 1930s watching the Connemara landscape lazily pass me by and my eyes grow heavier and heavier And soon, I am fast asleep and feeling safe and comfortable as I can possibly feel. I'm home. As you step aboard the Tren de los Suenos, South America's renowned overnight train, a sense of excitement and anticipation washes over you. The train, known for its exquisite journey through the heart of Chile, promises a voyage not just through landscapes, but through the soul of the country itself. Your destination is the mystical Atacama Desert, a journey that will take you through the night and into the early hours of the morning. Your cabin a blend of comfort and elegance welcomes you with its soft, warm lighting and plush seating. The interior is tastefully adorned with local artisanal decor, reflecting the rich cultural life of Chile. 
as you settle in. The train gently lurches forward. The beginning of your journey, marked by the slow rhythm of the wheels on the tracks. You feel a comforting sense of seclusion from the outside world, cocooned in your private space that feels like a home away from home. Outside your window, the landscape begins to unfold. The outskirts of Santiago slowly give way to the rolling vineyards of the Chilean wine country. The late afternoon sun casts a golden light over the vine-laden hills, and you watch as workers tend to the vines a scene of utter tranquility. As the train winds its way through the valleys, maybe you start to feel a connection to this land and to its people. As evening approaches, the dining car beckons. The softly lit car, with its inviting tables dressed in fine linen, offers a space for passengers to come together and share their journey. There is an old world elegance about this place, and you find yourself seated with some fellow travelers, each with their own story and reasons for embarking on this journey. Conversations flow and laughter fills the air, creating an atmosphere of camaraderie and shared adventure. As you begin to dine, the train begins to ascend into the Andean foothills. The changing elevation mirrored in the evolving landscape outside. The vineyards are now replaced by rugged hills and distant snow-capped peaks. Our nearest star, the sun, has now said goodbye to the day. And as the night deepens and the first stars begin to appear above the distant peaks, so does the sense of wonder for what lies ahead. This journey through the night promises not just a change in landscape, but perhaps a change within. As the train climbs higher and higher, you feel so safe here and the first drops of rain 
begin to putter against the windows of the dining car. The sound adds a rhythmic, soothing backdrop to your meal, enhancing the cozy ambience. The rain seems to cocoon the dining car, separating the warm, convivial interior from the cool, mysterious exterior. Soft lighting reflects off the window panes, turning each droplet into a twinkling star against the night sky. The gentle clinking of cutlery and the murmur of contented conversations blend with the rain's melody, creating a symphony of comfort and companionship. Seated across from you is an older gentleman. His eyes twinkle with the wisdom of years, and his smile is as warm as the Chilean sun. He introduces himself as Eduardo, a local who has traveled this route many times. As the two of you chat, the conversation deepens, moving from polite pleasantries to the sharing of life stories. Eduardo with a voice as smooth as the train journey you are on, recounts tales of his youth spent exploring the vast landscapes of Chile, each story a testament to a life well lived with passion and curiosity. The train rounds a bend and the landscape shifts, offering a view of a distant, dimly lit village. Eduardo points it out, his eyes reflecting a lifetime of memories. Every place you see has a story, just like every person you meet, he muses. And sometimes, the most unassuming places Hold the greatest tales. Maybe his words strike a chord with you, and you find yourself contemplating the stories behind the faces of those around you. The main course is served, a sumptuous array of traditional Chilean dishes, each bursting with flavor. Eduardo encourages you to try a local speciality, pastel de choclo a savory corn pie 
with a sweetness that surprises and delights your palate. The flavors are rich and comforting. The perfect accompaniment to the stories being shared. The smell of the hearty dish combined with the earthy scent of rain-soaked earth wafting in through a briefly opened door anchors you in the moment in the heart of Chile's culinary and cultural heritage. As the evening wears on, Eduardo shares a piece of wisdom that resonates deeply with you. In Chile, we say, life is a journey, not a destination. Remember, my friend, to savor each moment, each encounter. They are the steps that make up the dance of life. His words linger in your mind, mingling with the joy and excitement of your own journey on this magical train ride through the Andes. Maybe you realize that this journey is more than just a physical travel. It's an exploration of life itself. A collection of moments and meetings that are essentially what life is. You say goodnight to Eduardo and the rest of the group with gratitude. And leaving the warm atmosphere of the dining car, you make your way back to your cabin. The comforting sound of rain still accompanying the train's steady progress through the Andean night. The cabin, your private sanctuary, welcomes you back with its understated elegance and soothing ambience. As you enter, the soft, ambient lighting of the cabin greets you, casting a gentle glow that highlights the cabin's rich wooden paneling. The walls are adorned with beautiful pictures that depict scenes of Chilean landscapes, a tribute to the country's diverse beauty. A small polished wooden table sits beside a large window and the raindrops fall against the window, 
dancing rhythmically on the glass. The bed, the centerpiece of the cabin, is an invitation to rest and relaxation. You feel so safe here, so at peace, so far away from everything that you know. You are in life. Being in the moment You look at the bed. It is dressed in fine, crisp linens that feel both luxurious and comforting against your skin. It promises a night of deep, restful sleep. The sheet are a soft cream color, complementing the warm tones of the cabin. Plush pillows are propped up against the elegantly carved headboard, and a light weight, yet cozy woolen blanket Crafted by local artisans, rests at the foot of the bed. Beside the bed is a small nightstand on which rests a travel book about Chile. And once you are ready for bed, You climb under the covers and pick up this book and begin to read. You feel curious in this moment. The best state for a human mind to be in. You're also tired. The book is filled with fascinating facts about this remarkable country. You learn that Chile is one of the longest north to south countries in the world, stretching over 4,300 kilometers or 2,670 miles. And yet it averages only 177 kilometers, or 110 miles east to west. You also read that the Atacama Desert in the north is one of the driest places on earth, with some parts receiving less than a millimeter of rain each year. Conversely, The southern part of Chile is rich in forests, lakes, and fjords. As you continue reading, you discover that Chile is a land of volcanoes with more than five hundred potentially active ones, 
making it one of the most volcanic countries on Earth. You also read about the mysterious Moai statues of Easter Island, also known as Rapa Nui, which is a remote volcanic island in Polynesia and a special territory of Chile. With each fact, your sense of wonder about Chile grows. You place the book down, feeling a deeper connection to the land that unfolds beyond the rain-streaked window. Just before you close your eyes, you notice a book of poetry by the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. You pick it up and open on a page. The poem you see first is called If You Forget Me. If you forget me, I want you to know one thing. You know how this is. If I look at the crystal moon, at the red branch of the slow autumn at my window, if I touch near the fire, the impalpable ash or the wrinkled body of the log. Everything carries me to you as if everything that exists aromas, light, metals were little boats that sail toward those isles of yours that wait for me. Well, now, if little by little you stop loving me, I shall stop loving you little by little. If suddenly you forget me, do not look for me, for I shall already have forgotten you. If you think it long and mad, the wind of banners that passes through my life, and you decide to leave me at the shore of the heart where I have roots. Remember that on that day, at that hour, I shall lift my arms and my roots will set off to seek another land. But, if each day, each hour, you feel that you are destined for me with implacable sweetness, if each day a flower climbs up to your lips to seek me, ah, my love, Ah, my own, in me all that fire is repeated, in me nothing is extinguished or forgotten, 
My love feeds on your love, beloved. And as long as you live, it will be in your arms without leaving mine. You put the beautiful poetry book down, feeling an even deeper connection now to the people and the culture of this place. The gentle motion of the train, the comforting sound of the rain, and the wealth of knowledge and the beautiful poetry you've just absorbed coax you into a state of peaceful contemplation. In this cozy cabin, traveling through the night, Maybe you feel now a profound sense of contentment and anticipation for what is to come. The fabric of the sheets are cool and smooth against your skin. The rain outside creates a soothing symphony, a lullaby if you like. The plush pillow cradles your head as you nestle into a comfortable position, gazing out at the shadowy landscape passing by. The rain, now a gentle drizzle, traces meandering paths down the glass. Each droplet's journey, as unique as the train's own route through the Andes. The dim glow from the cabin's lights creates an atmosphere of coziness and warmth. The subtle scent of wood from the paneling and the faint earthy aroma brought in by the rain merge to create a feeling of being enveloped in nature even as you travel through it in this haven of comfort your mind drifts back to the facts about Chile you read earlier each one adding depth to your journey. The diverse landscapes, the rich history, and the vibrant culture seem to seep into your thoughts, enhancing your connection to this journey through the night. Gradually, the lulling motion of the train and the rhythmic sound of the rain lead you towards sleep. Your eyelids grow heavy 
and you let go of your conscious hold on the world, surrendering to the embrace of slumber. As you drift off, you feel safe and content, carried through the night by the steady, reassuring presence of the train. In this moment, you are cocooned in a world that is moving yet still, vast yet intimate. A traveler suspended in time and space on a journey through dreams. It's early evening in Paris. You are here in one of the world's great cities and you are preparing for a wonderful journey right across Europe. You are standing on the platform in Gare de l'Est the train station where the Orient Express leaves Paris. Perhaps you feel a little excited at this once-in-a-lifetime journey that is about to unfold in front of you. You look at the train, marvelous in its splendor. This train has lived in the imaginations of millions for a very long time. All sorts of stories surround the Orient Express. During the last war, it was known that many spies would travel back and forth across Europe and use the Orient Express as their means of travel. As you look at it now from the outside, 
It isn't difficult to imagine the world of those spies. You hear the sounds of the train getting ready. You see the people on the platform. You look at the faces of the people on the platform. You try and place them in different clothes. Maybe imagining that we are in the 1940s and the world is a very different place. But the Orient Express stays the same. The day has been hot in Paris, and so you are ready to be refreshed as you board this splendid locomotive. From the second you touch the train, you are transported to another world, to a time when care was taken over the smallest detail the craftsmanship on this train is immediately apparent. The textures of the different types of wood, the finery, even the smell brings you somewhere, somewhere you've never been before. Perhaps as you board this historical train, you feel calm and comforted by the care and attention to detail that is given to everything for this journey. You walk along the carriage, ticket in hand, being led to your compartment by a friendly train butler. Pierre shows you to your room, and when I say room, I really mean room, for you will be spending your time on this train in one of the finest suites the Orient Express has to offer. Pierre leaves you, and you breathe in your new surroundings. You sit down on the soft and sumptuous bed, and look around and simply breathe in and out, in and out. You decide to take off your shoes and socks, and the feeling of the luxurious carpet beneath your feet makes you feel very special indeed. This is a rare treat, only experienced by few. This train that you now sit on was the brainchild of a man called George Knacklemacker in 1865. He had this idea of a train that would span an entire continent, running on a continuous ribbon of metal for more than 1,500 miles. It was after a trip to America that George became inspired. He saw luxurious sleeper cars on trains and realized that he could do the exact same thing in Europe. It was on the 4th of October, 1883, that the Orient Express 
made its first journey from Paris to Istanbul. It was actually known as the Compagnie Internationale des Wagons Lit. Wagon Lit is the French for sleeper cars. But the newspapers gave the train the name we know today, the Orient Express. Why? Well, because the train travels east, towards the Orient, towards the great city of Istanbul, the only city in Europe that covers two continents. Now the train starts to leave the station. Perhaps you feel a great sense of joy at this magical moment occurring in your life. The train slowly moves through the great city of Paris and you look out the window saying goodbye to the city of lights. You see the Eiffel Tower in the distance, splendid in its elegance. And soon, Paris is far behind you, and the train rolls through the sleepy French countryside. The sun is setting now, and as you look onto the horizon, you can see that there are clouds moving in fast. It will rain tonight as you settle in to your Orient Express adventure. You decide to take a walk. You walk along the carriages. The train rhythmically moving beneath your feet. It strikes you how interesting it is to walk along this train as it moves at speed through the French countryside. In a way, you feel like you're walking back in time. You pass by some of the train porters as you walk and it strikes you that they could be from any period in time, from the last hundred years. You allow yourself to imagine that you are on the first ever journey of the Orient Express. You pass by other passengers. They smile at you and greet you. You give each other a knowing look. A look that says, we are very lucky people to be experiencing this wonderful journey. It is getting darker and darker outside now. You can see out through the windows as you walk through the train. You decide to stop for a moment at a door that has a long window. 
and you just stand there, feeling grounded, despite the moving train beneath your feet, you feel so safe and secure. And you look out at the darkening land beyond the train, the silhouettes of the hills around you. And you look up, and the first star is beginning to show her face. You are reminded that you are here on a great planet, floating through space and time. And this train that you are on is moving along the surface of this planet. And however big and however powerful this train may feel, it is but a tiny, tiny part of the life of this amazing planet that we are lucky enough to call our home. You know, being a human is a great privilege, and having life is an exceptionally rare and wonderful thing. And so while we are on planet Earth, and while we have life, it is a wonderful thing to allow ourselves to experience as much as possible. And this experience that you are having tonight, traveling on this great iconic train, is another great experience to add into the rich tapestry of your life. You continue to walk along the train. Perhaps you rejoice in the fact that no one knows where you are. You are anonymous here. How exciting. And how marvelous. Eventually, you arrive at the restaurant and bar. You sit at a little table. And you order a nice, refreshing drink and some food. Once again, you look around you. The attention to detail is mesmerizing. The smells all over the carriage are so comforting. The aroma of food being cooked to perfection by the Michelin-starred chef. The drinks being mixed in the bar with the finest of ingredients. And the different scents from the other passengers really allow you to let your mind wander. And maybe 
these scents bring back lots of memories. Memories of good times. As you sit and wait for your food, a drop appears on the window, and then another, and another, and soon you can see it is raining heavily. In the distance, you see the sky light up, and you realize that there is a storm happening outside the train. But in here, you feel so safe, so cozy. So secure. Eventually, your food arrives, and it is one of your favorite meals. Only here, it is cooked better than you have ever tasted. As the waiter places the plate in front of you, the food sitting on the finest china, he says bon appetit and leaves you to enjoy the comforting food that nourishes your body. As you enjoy every mouthful of food, it strikes you, perhaps, that this is a moment to savor. It isn't every night that you get to sit in one of the most famous trains that ever existed and eat food cooked by a Michelin-starred chef. You feel satisfied now, and maybe very peaceful. It's time now to walk back to your cabin you are starting to feel very sleepy. As you enter your room, perhaps a warm feeling of comfort overtakes you. This is where you will sleep for the next number of nights, all the way to Istanbul. This is your safe space. And what a safe space it is. So luxurious. So fine. Only the finest handmade products surround you. Right down to the beautiful 
Egyptian cotton sheets that you are about to get under. You do whatever you have to do to end your day. And then the moment arrives. The bed is just perfect. It's as if the bed has been made especially for you. The pillow feels like it has been carved to fit exactly the shape of your head and neck. You feel supported, safe, calm, and before you go to sleep, you take out your favorite book and start to read in the dimly lit room. The sound of the train continues, rhythmically clicking and clacking through the countryside that is beyond the darkened windows. A thought strikes you that you are not seeing what is outside. But, perhaps you are excited to enjoy whatever views will come tomorrow. But for now, as you read your book, and the rain falls outside, and the sound of thunder rumbles in the distance, and your mind is filled with all of the images that your book provides. Everything feels just right and your eyes become heavy and you fall into the most deep and restful sleep you have ever had. And as you sleep, you sleep safe in the knowledge that the attentive staff aboard this train are looking after all of your needs and all of the other passengers. Everyone is safe.
The night passes and you awake to breakfast in bed. You are staying in the most expensive room on the train. And so breakfast in bed just feels right. Your porter comes in and presents you with your favorite breakfast. And then they open the curtain and allow you to look out on the magnificent view beyond. You are then left alone to enjoy the nourishing food. The train is as constant as ever, rhythmically trundling through the landscape. And what a landscape you find yourself in now. You are in the Austrian Alps. You can't help but get out of bed to go and look closer. What you see is startling. The splendid mountains rise high above the train. You see snow at the top, and above the snow, a blue sky, a blue you're not sure you've ever seen before. This is a special place. The morning moon still sits in the sky, humble and unassuming, constant as the train. The rock of the mountains so strong so ancient how wonderful the natural world is the green of the grass the white of the snow the blue of the sky, the heat of the sun, all combine to fill you, perhaps, with a warm glow of peace and tranquility, serenity, and calm. Your time aboard the Orient Express is phenomenal. You see the great city of Vienna, home to Beethoven and Mozart, one of the finest cities in all of Europe. You visit Budapest, the great Hungarian city that was once two cities, Buda and Pest. And the further east you travel, 
the more you notice the subtle changes in the people you see and the landscape. Perhaps you are struck by the thought that no matter where we are from or who we are or what background we have, we are all humans living on this great planet, doing our best with what we are presented with. You travel to Bucharest, the capital of Romania, a very interesting place. where you witness some great splendor of the old buildings of the city, a place that was once known as the Paris of the East. And then you arrive in one of the great cities not only of Europe, but of the world, Istanbul. This city enchants all who visit her. And as the train pulls in to the main station in Istanbul, you feel a different energy in this place. You feel immense gratitude to all who got you here safely. You feel immense gratitude for the experiences that you had and the many opulent sleeps that you enjoyed. You leave the train and begin walking through the streets of Istanbul. You hear the sound of the Muslim call to prayer and you know that you are in a very different place to where you started. The smells are different too. The faces of the people different. The energy different. Now, sink into a restful and peaceful sleep. Your body works powerfully and reliably. You can detach your mind from my words. Drift off. Dream and sleep. You are safe and secure. Sleep deeply and soundly. Your body heals, regenerates, strengthens. Everything works powerfully and reliably. Your mind rests. You can let yourself 
drift away. All is warm. All is safe. Everything rests in the depths of the night. Everything is good. And you feel good. Perhaps you feel a tingling in your feet or hands, or perceive a heaviness or lightness. It helps you to switch off. Wake up the next morning refreshed and energized with new motivation and strength. Be open for your self-healing. Open for your sleep and deep relaxation. Everything is good as it is. Everything relaxes. Everything lets go. And all is well. You sleep deeply and all is well. You sleep tight. You dream deeply and all is well with you. Your muscles are warm. You slumber deeply. Everything is soft. And everything is good. Sleep well. You have earned it. And while you may drift into wonderful dreams, your subconscious takes in the following affirmations. I fall into a peaceful and restful sleep. I relax each of my muscles with every second they grow warmer and heavier. It was the late afternoon when I arrived in the central station in Mumbai. It was hot. It was October. And I was 
very excited, filled with joy in fact, to be traveling on an Indian train and heading for Goa. I had never been on an Indian train before, and to be honest, I don't remember if I knew what to expect. I had my lonely planet guide and my rough guide to India. I had probably read about what it would be like to travel on an Indian train, but really nothing could have prepared me for what I experienced in the most memorable journey of my life. I queued for what felt like a very long time. When I got to the top of the queue, I asked could I get a ticket for Goa. I'd only been in India for a couple of days by then, and the man behind the counter nodded his head in an unusual way. It kind of went from side to side. I'd learn later that that would often mean yes, but I couldn't be sure. Anyway, I got my ticket for the second class sleeper carriage and went to find my train. I remember that the train was blue and it was extremely long. I also remember that there were a lot of people in the station and a lot of smiling faces. Everyone seemed kind of happy here. The heat. The heat was something new to me. A kind of tropical heat. I was only in my early twenties, and this was my first time so far away from home. I found my compartment. It was a bunk bed in a little square room. And the pervading feeling of finding that place has stayed with me all of this time. It is a feeling of coziness, safety, curiosity, and adventure. I picked my bed as I was the first one there. I went for the bottom bunk 
if I recall. It could have been the top, but I can't be sure. I know that I chose the one going in the direction the train would travel. That was important for me. And, as I always do, I set up my little house, if you like, my little area, to be as comfortable and enjoyable as possible. I was traveling like most backpackers do, with one big bag on my back and one smaller rucksack on my front. The big bag I didn't need in this moment The smaller bag had all of the goodies. So, what were my goodies? What kept me entertained and sustained on this twelve-hour train journey? Well, in those days, as is the case today, I never traveled anywhere without my journal. I also had my two guidebooks. And of course, the book that I was reading at the time, a pretty famous book called The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. Of course, I had some water, some samosas to eat. And lastly, my camera. This was a time before smartphones. Yes, it's not that long ago, but it was a time before we lost the simplicity that we didn't even know we were about to lose. In this time, people read books more. They probably communicated more face to face. Or maybe I'm just being nostalgic. I do remember, though, that when the people who would share my little courage came along, that I talked to them a lot. They were, if I'm not mistaken, two Australian girls backpacking around India.
it was time for the train to leave the station. And all I can say is that when I think of that moment, a great feeling of openness and serenity passes through me. It's like my soul smiles. The air from outside started to come in through the open window. The windows never close. In fact, I don't think there are windows in those second-class sleeper trains. Just bars. It was kind of like beautiful, soft air conditioning, and natural too. I remember looking out the window. as I got my first glimpses of the Indian countryside. I remember fields, fields and fields, and palm trees, lots and lots of palm trees. And I remember breathing in that moment. Big, deep breaths. Breathing in the expansive, beautiful energy around me. An energy that I never knew existed until I went there. In fact, I remember in India smelling smells that I'd never smelled, hearing sounds that I'd never heard. In some ways, it was like going to another planet, a beautiful, vibrant, colorful planet. As the soft 
breeze came through the window and I settled in to my little habitat. I remember journaling vividly In fact, I still have that journal. I wrote about Mumbai and how it is unlike anywhere I have ever been. I wrote about my anticipation of what was to come. I wrote about what I was seeing around me. I wrote about a moment when I passed by a very poor area. was that everyone was smiling. Ladies were out washing their babies and the men were talking to each other, doing different jobs. But that one image has stayed with me all of these years. An image of community, of people working together. train continued to move through the beautiful Indian countryside, traveling down the west coast of this vast subcontinent. Trains in India are so important to the people. You know, they span over 67,000 kilometers and they connect almost every corner of the country. India has over 1.3 billion people and millions of people take the Indian trains 
every day. The trains provide employment and they move tourists like me around the country. Another thing that I remember was that people are very curious in India, especially if you are obviously not from there. Where are you from, sir? They would ask me. Ireland. I would tell them. What is your job, sir? I'm an actor. I would tell them. Are you a famous actor? No, I'm not. I would tell them. But that didn't matter. I might as well have been famous. I remember I had a pair of sunglasses with green rims and everyone who saw them on me asked me if they could try them on and so I let them and took a photo of them wearing the sunglasses. I still have my photos from India. Thousands of photos, in fact. Printed out on paper And at least 30 of those photos are of people wearing my green sunglasses. the train would stop in little stations along the way. People would smile and wave at the train, excited to see something different in their day. The evening wore on, and the sun began to set. mystical Indian landscape. And as 
as it got darker outside, and the first stars began to appear. I felt cozier and cozier as I settled in to my little bed. As I listened to the sounds around me, the rhythmic clickety-clack of the train on the tracks. The people talking to each other. The boys walking through the train selling chai Chai, 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 they would say. And I remember just feeling deeply curious and deeply alive. But I was tired. The day had been long. And the adventure is great. And so I opened my beloved book. And settled in for a read. How cozy it was to read this great book. Lying down in a cozy bed on a magnificent train in a beautiful enchanting country everything felt so tranquil, everything in that moment felt just right. For in that moment, Beautiful truth is that I didn't want for anything. I had all I needed. My eyes grew heavier and heavier.
and soon I fell into a deep, rejuvenating sleep. Safe in the knowledge that tomorrow I would be enjoying Tropical beaches of Goa. There once was a train, a train like no other. Now this train, it had no place to call home. It was known by most as the world's train. And if you were to see the train, you would marvel at its splendor. For this train was the finest looking, beautiful old train that had ever been crafted by the hand of humankind. Not many people ever got to travel on the train. But tonight, you are one of the lucky few. You are in India. You are waiting on a special platform in the central station of Mumbai. You see your train come into sight. The warm and gentle evening sun of the Indian subcontinent comforts you as you close your eyes and breathe in this moment. You feel so safe here, so curious. And maybe you experience a deep inner joy at the prospect of tonight's adventure. For this really will be an adventure of a lifetime. The train is unlike anything you have seen before. Pristine. Luxurious. And there is something so immediately calming about it that you can't wait to see inside. As you climb the few steps onto the carriage, 
you are greeted by the kind, smiling faces of the train staff, who all seem to know your name, and immediately they feel like family. The first thing you notice are the scents around the train. Deeply calming fragrances of lavender and jasmine waft through this paradise on wheels. And you feel more and more connected to this moment. And perhaps you begin to commit to let go of your tensions and allow yourself to become immersed in this world. As you traverse through the narrow corridors of the train, the soft glow from the ornate lamps lining the walls casts a warm, inviting light on the polished wooden panels. The carpet beneath your feet is thick and plush. And along the hallway, there are beautiful paintings depicting scenes of Indian mythology and mountain landscapes and scenes from the rainforest. You are shown to your private cabin, and it is nothing short of a royal suite. Rich tapestries hang from the ceiling, and the bed is decked in silk sheets and sits grandly in the middle of the room. There are large windows on one side, through which you can see the world outside whisk by. No one can see through them, though. Only you can see out, which makes you feel even more cozy. The room is decorated with fresh flowers, and their sweet scent mixes with the lavender and the jasmine. You feel so tranquil here. And as the train 
slowly pulls out of the station in Mumbai. You begin to feel in sync with the rhythm of the train. As the train says goodbye to Mumbai and begins this magical journey, you lean back and you close your eyes. The gentle rocking lulling you into a state of peaceful calm. A soft, lilting melody floats through the air from somewhere in the train which just adds to the mystical ambience the train weaves its way through the beautiful Indian countryside. The constant rhythmic sounds of the tracks, a comforting, hypnotic lullaby. You look out upon this magical land as the sun, our nearest star, says good night to the Indian subcontinent for another day. You see villagers walk towards their homes. You see these humans connecting, smiling, laughing. Perhaps you enjoy the many colors that the villagers wear as you pass village after village, while at the same time enjoying the majestic sunset that feels like it is just yours. It is in moments like this that we remember we live on a planet, a beautiful
beautiful, magical planet. Soon, the train travels under a starlit sky. The air becomes cooler. Carrying with it the earthy aroma of the countryside. Through your window, you see fireflies dance in the night. You see the twinkling lights of the little villages. And you feel so safe here, so at peace. You decide to explore the train further. your carriage and wander along the corridors. You find a quaint library filled with ancient leather bound books. You find a stylishly decorated lounge with comfortable sofas and a grand piano. You even find a small theater where silent movies play. In each compartment there's a story to be told. After some time, you find yourself in the observation carriage. This carriage is almost completely made of windows. You lie down on one of the cozy blankets and look up through the giant window above you at the night sky stars. You see a shooting star and make a wish. In 
this moment, the train begins to make its own path. You realize that this magic safe train is traveling across the ocean. It is making its own path, laying tracks magically as it goes. Around you is just the moonlit ocean and the stars in the night sky. The ocean sparkles beneath the starry sky. Soon, you feel very tired, and you walk back through the magic train to your magic carriage. The sound of the ocean and the train lull you deeper and deeper into the most restful sleep of your life.
Then, as the sun gently bids hello to a new day, you slowly and dreamily drift into this day. But you might as well be in a dream. Because your magic train has made its own way across the Indian Ocean and now you are in Madagascar As the train moves through the Madagascan countryside and makes its own tracks through the forests, the first thing you notice are the colors. A vibrant canvas of lush greenery. Splashes of exotic flowers in full bloom. And you are met. By a breathtaking view from above of the dense, sprawling rainforest of Madagascar. The train gently winds its way through this untouched wilderness. A tranquil journey through a land of untamed beauty. decide to go to the spa carriage. You walk along the magic train and open the door to the spa relaxation area. A kindly looking lady greets you and offers you whatever kind of treatment you would like. Massage, facial, Anything you like. A 
And as you receive your treatment, you look around this carriage You realize that it takes on the form of any landscape that you pass. And so, as you lie in this completely blissful state. You feel like you are outside in the natural majesty of the rainforest. You spot playful lemurs hopping from branch to branch on the tall majestic trees, their furry tails swishing as they play in the morning light. Birds of paradise fly through the air and perhaps you feel the freedom that they do in this moment. You breathe in the wonderful smell of vanilla, a signature fragrance of Madagascar. Later in the day, as you sit in the observation room, as your magic train builds its tracks along a Madagascar beach, And you watch the sunset. You are joined by a kind elderly woman. You both sit in silence for some time. And then, she speaks. She seems to know what you need to hear in this moment. She has been traveling on the magic train 
for many years and has learned a lot about the world and about life. She begins to share her wisdom with you. Her voice is a calming melody against the soft whispers of the waves outside. This train, she starts, has taught me much about the world. But more importantly, it's taught me about the importance of the journey itself. Life, she says, is much like this magical train ride. We may know our destination, or we might not, but it's the voyage, the experiences we gather, the landscapes we see. before it, and sometimes it's not, and that's okay. Like this train, this magic train, we all have the power to create our own path, to forge our own way, no matter the circumstances. Her words, simple yet profound, hang in the air as she smiles at you, her eyes gleaming with wisdom. A 
as the sun finally disappears beyond the horizon. It offers you once more a magical view to behold. You look out on the beach that you lazily trundle along. The palm trees swaying gently in the moonlight and the crystal clear water rhythmically moving in and out. You retreat to your cabin And you climb under your silk sheets And you say goodbye To this magical day On this magical train And you know that tomorrow the train will continue to carve its path forward and you allow yourself to fall asleep in the knowledge that you are safe on this great adventure.